How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Terror Talk. Guys, we are going to discuss key questions to ask yourself before becoming a correctional supervisor. I put this topic out to my followers on my social medias. I was able to categorize these questions into 10 categories. My guests are going to be Russ and Joe. I'm going to kind of um, break down these categories, throw through questions to the guys. We'll see which ones we're able to answer. I'm also going to get involved. Some of these questions are really good. And what's great about this, guys, is we're going to answer these questions on a very personal and experienced level. So basically, this show is before you make a supervisor, these are the questions you need to ask yourself. Because remember, guys, when you become a supervisor in corrections at any level, whether it's the initial front line, whether it's the prison management side, which I've been doing for almost a decade now, there, there's really you're not doing it for perks. Because trust me, even if you think there's perks, they run thin when it comes to the responsibility that uh, you're going to have. Responsibility of a team, responsibility just of the uh, managing of, of, of liability at some level, uh, whatever that level is that you sit. And uh, I think it's definitely a good discussion. And I know some people are saying they're being forced into the position. So even if you're being forced into position, even if it's something that you don't want, um, if, you, if you have to take it, these are questions that you could also ask yourself to help you grow into the position because that's the key help you grow and i want to add one more thing guys when you move up a lot of people think you have more freedom and nah, you're tied down with more responsibility so you have the illusion of freedom and sometimes guys you even have uh, you're responsible for things you may not even have authority over so there's just a lot of things to take into account but as i said my guests are gonna be russ and joe but before we go into that guys a couple books on the market we have inmate manipulation decoded this book is available on amazon link to this is in the description this book does very well so thank you guys for continuing to support this book this book's been out for a few years so thank you we also have how to succeed in corrections and tips for new correction officers and their supervisors this, these books are available from blue 360 media guys there's just i can't there's just tons of tips in this book there are passages uh, supported by other professionals in the field from different walks of the profession. Uh, you get these two books right off the bat tied with this. There's just so much information provided. Also, got to give you guys some more updates. All the I have three more books, four more books that are coming out right now that are that are pretty much done with the editing. Uh, they are actually probably be up to market soon. They're all going to be available on Blue 360 Media. So if you go to the website, you may be able to pre-order them. I believe some people have pre-ordered them already, so thank you. Uh, and then there's one I actually self-published. Uh, so let's do the – first off, let's see. Do I have the pictures here or did I take them down? No, I think I do. Let me see. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't put the pictures up yet. Okay, so I have Dealing with an Unruly Inmate. That's been published by Blue 360 Meter. It's a smaller book, about 46 pages. It's got a cover similar to this. But when I tell you it may only be six or seven chapters, I write everything. So it's a book that you're going to wind up reading multiple times because in those six or seven chapters, we cover a lot. I was also very happy because I got my other book uh, called Unlocking Leadership Potential, which is a book very similar to format in this. It's got 129 added passages that can complement this book very well, as well as this book. Uh, we revisit a few topics, but we also add a lot of new stuff. If we revisit a topic, it's because we're adding a different perspective. So even if you see there's a couple of times you may see um, the same topic, but watch as you read it because the topics are going to be coming from different perspectives and how they view it. And then I got a definitive book on report writing coming out. That's a big book. That's by Blue 360 Media as well. They're publishing it. And that pretty much I don't know, man. That that book was um, a good amount of work. I had to borrow from ChatGPT a little bit to help me organize it. Um, but that book itself has got a lot of information, especially uh, when it comes to liability, uh, what management expects from reports, what your supervisor at the front line should expect, what you should expect. Covers a lot. And then uh, I do have this book. It's coming out in soft cover soon, but right now it is available on an ebook, and it's called Crossing Boundaries. Uh, that's the uh, soft cover, um, what is it? soft cover cover? That's what I want to say. Soft, soft book cover, paperback, the paperback. That's the word I'm looking for. My friend Sandy Hassan did that. She's amazing. Uh, she actually also formatted the book for paperback. Uh, she actually is going to be uploading that within the next couple of days. So that book should be out on the market in a couple of days as a soft cover. You can get it now as an ebook, 
or you could wait and for uh, $20, you can get it as a soft cover. I think it's around 130 pages. And I will say this, that's the road to undo familiarity. You partner this with Inmate Manipulation Decoded and you got yourself uh, the foundation for a great training that you want to offer. You could do maybe a two-day training worth of material that's just in that book alone. Two eight-hour day trainings. And if you allow for discussion, because these books are meant to be discussion worthy, you could do these trainings. They could be at least three to five days. All right, let me get uh, Russ. What up, Russ? I'm here, Anthony. How's everything going? Good. Hey, Russ, you mind introducing yourself to our audience, please? Uh, of course. My name is Russ Hamilton. I am a former and retired sergeant from California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I am also the founder of Keepers of Chaos. I am um, an often, uh, I often appear here on uh, Tear Talk um, as a panel member. And uh, let's see, I think that about, I think that about does it for, for everything. Um, I think I put everything in there. Yeah, and uh, did, did, I forgot, did you say anything about Keepers of Chaos? Yes, I said something about Keepers of Chaos. I'm just a little bit distracted today. Just had a actually had a great birthday party, and well, not a party. Uh, it was just me and my wife, but we had a we had a great dinner. And it's uh, your birthday. And she, it's your it's your birthday. Yeah, your birthday? yeah. Today's I'm my big honest, my, yeah. You have got you so have, many profiles on Facebook that I don't know when. It, I thought your birthday just passed. No, well. How do I put this? I say, like, you know, there's been times where some people have been after me. And so sometimes not necessarily all of the information about me is true. Um, you know, there's uh, places uh, and profiles of uh, places I've never lived, things I've never done, uh, and so forth. And so uh, most of my birthdays are fake. This one's real. Okay, good. So then... Your birthday and it's, is it's my big my big sixty first birthday. Ah, you're into the sixties now. Wow. Well, you look good, Russ. You look really good. I'm I'm trying yeah. hard, man. I, I I keep it up every single day. So who's older, you or Joe? I think I'm older. Is that Joe's, you, Joe? Joe's still a young stud. Yeah, I think he's frozen. <laughs> oh no! I, I think he's he, back. I think oh, no, no. He was. He's, 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 he's faking. Around. He's faking. Uh, hey Joe, you mind introducing yourself? What do you got? What's that smell? Is that Social Security? I smell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something like that. Hello, hey, everybody Joe. from from the hot state of Texas. My name is Joe Carbonio. Uh, I'm a retired uh -oh. Texas Department of Corrections, and uh, been been retired since 2021. I retired the rank of lieutenant. Um, currently working in our local uh, sheriff's department in the jail division as an assistant jail administrator and a panel member here for Tear Talk. Love to have you. Almost lost you for a second, but we got you back. Whew. So, so guys, I just want to kind of go over this. So, I, I think a lot of people take crossing into being a supervisor lightly, uh, especially if they're very perk driven. I think in one of my books, maybe in the last book I have coming out, uh, you know, I, I make sure that people know that. You know, moving up is it should never be motivated by perks. I mean, you're not lured into leadership. You should be led into leadership. What I mean by led is being inspired to do something better uh, than what was left before you. Uh, I know a lot of people kind of get lured into it. And then when they ask themselves the questions to keep themselves motivated, the questions are extremely superficial. The questions are more about the money, which matters. But at this point, there's more to it than just the money, um, maybe even a better parking space. Uh, but I think that the questions that we're going to ask today are questions that help you become the leader that not only do you need to be and not only that the agency expects, but also that your people need and expect. So I, I think this is a good topic. Uh, I'll go first with Russ. Do you think a topic like this is needed now, Russ? Um, yeah, you know, I think it's um, I think one thing that we want to do, you know, from uh, the basis of uh, Keepers of Chaos, from the basis of um, Tear Talk, is you know we want to explore subjects that help um, the people that we uh, you know basically uh, shepherd and, and minister to to be able to make the right decisions and to be able to you know uh, give them some insight um, and some things to think about that um, otherwise are left unattended pretty much, and so. 
um, when we look at, um, you know, the things that, um, that come into play when we're trying to decide, you know, whether or not we should promote, should we pursue something? Um, I think it's better to take a deep dive and uh, before you put it all on the line than it is to just go in uh, willy nilly and uh, just decide, hey, I'm just gonna, you know, uh, promote and, and see what happens. Um, you should do this in an intentional manner um, that allows you to help your department, help your people, um, and uh, actually, you know, increase safety and security. And uh, because, you know, you're really placed in a um, position of, you know, stewardship over people that uh, really look at you to lead. And I know that we've done things before on like, you know, positional leadership. Um, but what we're really talking about here is, is, you know, what is your motivation? Why, why should or why does a person decide to pursue, um, you know, a, a promotion or not? Yeah, and I, and I think these are the questions that most may not even know to ask themselves because we have a lot of people that may be crossing in for that perk uh, and they don't realize it. But once you get into that position, even if there is a perk, which most likely there's not, uh, it really doesn't hold enough weight for that to be the only reason why you're moving up. Uh, Joe, what's your thoughts, Joe? It's definitely something, a, a topic worth discussing. Yeah, definitely. Because, a lot, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people start to climb the ladder for the wrong reasons. You know, you got to realize once, once you throw your name in a hat for a promotion, um, and, and you actually get it. It's not about you anymore. Now it's about you leading a team. Um, if you're doing it just for the perks, you're doing it for the entirely just totally wrong reasons. And uh, you're not going to be nowhere near as effective uh, for you. And you're not going to be effective for your people. You know, becoming a supervisor is not something that, you know, it's it's not something you should weigh lightly. I mean, I know I did because I was a young father trying to raise kids. Um you know, it, it's <clears throat> sometimes the, the becoming a supervisor, the, that task and that job becomes demanding of time. Um, to look at your, your personal life and you also have to look at your work life to see if you can balance both of them. And again, you know, if you're putting in if you're putting in promotional package just for the perks, don't uh, because you're not going to be effective. At all. You're not going to be, you know, the, becoming a supervisor is about becoming a leader, about becoming a trainer. Um, you know, being that being that in between between the admin and your folks down bottom fading heat, um, you know, it's all about the support that you're supposed to be giving your folks and not yourself. Yeah. And guys, even though I said correctional officer, super, uh, correctional supervisor, I mean, obviously, this is going to apply to things outside corrections as well. Now, granted, I got a whole mess of responses. So what I did was, thank you, ChatGPT. I asked them to category, uh, categorically, uh, no, I could say categorize, categorize the questions uh, into different categories. So they came up with 10 categories and then basically they put a group of questions into each category. So with that said, guys, I don't usually do it this way, but I'm going to read off what's what's there for each category. And then you guys can answer what you feel is relevant. Uh, because we're not going to be able to answer every question here, but I'm not going to be biased and just pick the questions that I think matter to me. I'm just going to read them to you guys, and then you could guys decide what areas you want to touch on. And if you don't want to touch on it, that's fine. So the main question here for the first one uh, is, let me see. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off what I got. And then we'll go ahead and see which questions we feel that we can answer. So there's a little bit in the description, and then there is the actual, there's two other questions as an add-on. So the first thing we got right now is, am I ready to transition transition from being a peer to a leader? Now, granted, guys, there's no order to these questions. So basically, this is about uh, shifting from being one of the team to leading the team can be challenging. So we're looking to see if people can reflect on how you'll manage the dynamics of these evolving relationships. Will you be able to maintain friendships while also enforcing rules and holding others accountable? How will you earn respect and trust in your new role without alienating those you once worked alongside? And then there's two additional questions. How will I handle situations where my former peers test my authority? And what strategies will I use to build credibility and assert my leadership effectively? I know I can answer how will I handle situations where my former peers 
test my authority. So I do want to attack that, but I'll go with uh, Russ first. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, that's actually um, the one that, uh, you know, kind of, you know, came out um, to me in just thinking about uh, knowing that you're going to add a new dimension um, that you have to be prepared for. Um, you get to a point in your career, obviously, where, um, you know, you have a level of expertise in working alongside your peers and um, dealing with inmates, dealing with incidents, um, dealing with your supervisors, dealing with uh, management and admin and everything. And sometimes you get to a level of comfortability there because you know what that playing field looks like for you. Um, when you start thinking about, okay, what's going to happen when I start, you know, having conflicts um, with the people that I'm currently comfortable with, not everybody's uh, willing to, uh, to look at and deal with that kind of thing. Um, I think, you know, um, for me, it was uh, a, a natural concern. Um, but there were things that, um, to me, overrode that. I had gotten to a point in my career um, where I really felt like I wanted to be able to make a bigger impact, um, uh, mostly with regards um, to being able to, you know, pass on some of my knowledge, um, be able to, um, you know, try and uh, share some of the things that I've learned with staff and to try and, um, you know, help the facility and the department along because I felt that um, there were some gaps with regards to, um, you know, talent, ability, and um, things happening at that supervisory level. Um, there was just, in, in my view, a, a general lack of, of talent, not that everybody lacked talent, but just a, a general lack overall. And so that's the point at which you have to say, well, you know what, everything else be damned. Um, you know, I'm just going to have to, uh, you know, deal with that. And uh, then once you get to that point and uh, on day one, suddenly, you know, you're challenged, um, as I was in that. It was very early on in, in my promotion where, you know, the union just decided, hey, we're just going to cause issues for you just to cause issues. And there were no actual issues. It was just things that they manufactured. And that was a wake up call. Uh, because, you know, it made me realize that, um, you know, we work sometimes at cross purposes for no other reason than to showcase cross purposes. And so it is something um, that you better be willing to get in there and, and work on and uh, do your best to solve with, you know, logic and sweat and blood. Um, so that's kind of my take on it. All right. And then what do you what do you got, Joe? Well, you know, transitioning from a peer to a leader is really not that difficult if you're in the right mindset and have the right frame of mind. I mean, if, if you're already supporting your peers, um, if you're already, you know, giving them, <laughs> giving them direction, um, you know, helping them, you know, assist them and, and you know, the, the building blocks of doing their jobs, um, you know, you're a step ahead anyway. Um, in that case, you know, going from a peer to a leader um, is a pretty easy transition as long as, uh, you know, everybody involved understands that, you know, now that you're a leader, your responsibilities kind of shift a little bit. And, you know, you gain some more you gain some more uh, supervisory capabilities, which, you know, cause you to, to have to kind of separate yourself from being one of the peers. Um, but at the same token, you're still in the support role. You're still going to give them the guidance. You're still going to give them the knowledge. You're still going to give them the direction. Now it's just from a supervisory standpoint. So it, it's all on your maturity level and how you handle it. Um, you know, some people, some people, you know, once you promote, don't take it well. Um, you know, I was blessed in the fact that, you know, when I went from correctional officer to a sergeant, I had a lot of, I had a lot of good people behind me. I had a lot of good support. And, um, you know, it wasn't, but a few months later, I was back on that shift as a, as a supervisor, as a sergeant. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, they had a firm understanding because they knew ahead of time where my direction was going, uh, and what my, what my thought process was. So they were, they were pretty much on board. Um, so, you know, really the, the transition is, is based on the individual at the time, you know, how much. How much of a peer were you to your other peers uh, before becoming a leader? 
Yeah, I, I like what you're saying, by the way, because we, we actually call them emerging leaders. I mean, these are people that even the peers see them. Uh, and eventually, even your peers may push uh, you to become that leader, take the authority officially, you know, or take that leadership position officially. Like like Joe had mentioned, I mean, some people are leaders that just may not be considered official uh, leaders, but in their eyes, they are. But the question that I want to answer on this that I, that I like was, how will I handle situations where my former peers test my authority? So I've been lucky. I work in state prison. So every time I've made rank, I have moved to um, other facilities. So that gave me a chance to basically adjust in the role. And the people that were at those facilities only saw me at that rank. Now, if you work at a jail, that's going to be a little bit tougher because uh, you may not be getting transferred out. So when you make rank, you will be directly supervising uh, people that you once worked next to. So now the adjustment is more on you. Where for me, as I said, I got lucky. Uh, the adjustment, I, I didn't really have it because the people that I was interacting with now, I I've never worked with as peers. But I will say this, when people transferred in later on, who I may have worked with as officers, they had to make the adjustment because the environment already welcomed me as a supervisor. Uh, but there is going to be an adjustment. Uh, but with that said, uh, I just want to add that if you've done your job correctly and you're a professional, uh, you're not making any adjustment to your behaviors. I mean, people should know what to expect from you because you should be carrying out that level of consistency. So with that said, if I if I become a supervisor, I, I'm still going to be that professional I always was. Now, it only becomes harder if you were never that professional and now you want to play the role when you move up. Now that's, that's going to be a concern because people are going to try to bring you backwards when you are trying to enforce what needs to be enforced. For me, there was a moment where I had to write somebody who uh, I did work with, who I did hold in high regard. We were officers together. I looked inwards uh, to make sure that I had exhausted all effort, but it was a point where the person had to be written. And it was a true test of my resolve. It's not something I wanted to do, uh, but I had to do it. And once I just said, you know what, when I was comfortable with the point that I had to write this person, because at this point here, their, their lack of effort was affecting the team. So people were looking at me and how I was dealing with that person. Uh, I, I set that boundary right, like, right off the bat now. And now for me, it's been a little bit easier if I have to cross into uh, from being a peer to some, some extent. Uh, to play in that supervisory role. You know, I mean, most of the time, I, I don't have to bark out authority. That's not how I roll anyway. Uh, but I also think people know what's in me. So I think, you know, th there's a respect to that, which uh, allows me to be who I need to be and barely ever play that role. So again, I thought that was a great question. I don't think it's an easy transition, but I think it's easier if you were a professional the whole route, and then you just got to step into being that professional at a higher level. All right, so the next question, okay, is do I have communication skills to effectively manage and motivate a team? So supervisory roles require more than just clear communication. They demand the ability to inspire and guide a team towards common goals. Evaluate your ability to listen, convey expectations, and provide feedback in a way that is constructive and encouraging. So how will you handle communication in difficult or high pressure situations? Consider whether you can adapt your communication style to different personalities and situations. And uh, the two follow-ups are, how will I ensure that my communication is understood and accepted by all team members? And what methods will I use to provide feedback that motivates improvement rather than discourages my team? So I'll start with Joe first, alternate it. Anything you want to answer, Joe, from there, your call. Yeah, I mean, as far as communication skills, you know, you have to have professionalism and tact when you're a supervisor and, and communicating, you know, to your team and trying to motivate them. You know, not not every day is a good day and, you know, not every every day is a bad day. So, you know, if there, there are things that need to be discussed, you know, get get the bad stuff out of the way and and you always end it, end it on a positive. You can't go in there looking to dominate, uh, dictate, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Um, you know, you lose a lot of respect factor. I mean, people understand there's going to be times where things need to be addressed. 
Um, you know, you shouldn't address the whole team for the actions of one. Um, you know, so that's that's something that's that was always important to me. You know, I, I'm never I've never been the kind to go to a shift briefing and, and take something out on the whole team when it was just one person that that caused the issue. Um, you know, communication is a big factor in supervision. You have to be able to communicate clearly. You have to be able to communicate your your intent, what you expect, um, you know, and not everything, not everything needs to be negative. You know, if there are good things that need to be pointed out, make sure you point them out because they mean just as much, if not more than the bad things. Uh, you know, we do understand and it's not just, you know, corrections, any, any, any walk of life. There are going to be things that need, you know, you know, that need to be discussed to get out the way, you know, things that, you know, we may be not doing correctly that need to be corrected uh, on, at, at the team level. Um, and there's going to be times where, you know, things are done correctly and, and they need to be praised for it. Um, you know, one of the one of the big issues as far as, you know, being a supervisor, you know, besides clear communication is sincerity. You know, always communicate it in a way that your staff understands that there's an issue that needs to be taken care of, but, you know, that is coming from the heart and not from the anger. Um, you know, being able to motivate your team is a must. You have to keep them motivated. You know, it, it's bad enough in corrections. You know, the job itself is hard enough. The last thing, the last thing we need is somebody that's going to come in there and you know hammer on them all the time you know you're going to lose people you're going to lose your you're going to lose your respectability you're going to lose your loyalty you're going to lose your dedication you know you're just going to lose your people period they're just going to turn you know as soon as you step in the room they're just going to turn you off so you know be effective in your communication be sincere be truthful be transparent about it and you know if they if they if they do bad collectively as a team address it get it out of the way, discuss it, let them know why. If they're doing good as a team, damn sure let them know why. You know, just just be honest and sincere on both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, that's the the feedback. And the feedback should be immediate and relevant. Um, you don't want to give feedback, you know, months later. Um, that seems to be a habit for most people. And sometimes they do that feedback because it's forced, because it's needed on a par. Um, hey, Russ, what's your thoughts on communication? Well, you know, when I when I see the the question here in the in the way it's it's formatted, um, you know, I think that the the time to um, you know having the time to have developed those communication skills um, is um, at a point where you no longer should have to ask this question of yourself um, at the point at which you're starting to get in. If you haven't put yourself into a position. Um, of stress where you have to be able to communicate effectively. Um, and that includes, you know, uh, the written word that includes, um, you know, being involved in, in things where, uh, you know, you're taking the bull by the horns and you're leading people, you know, actually um, into battle. Um, if you're not, um, you know, comfortable with, uh, you know, talking with inmates, if you're not comfortable with uh, talking with your peers, um, then you're already out of your depth. And you can't simply you can't simply start this process um, at the point at which you promote. You should already have been tested and vetted and know that you have some good communication skills up to this point. And there should be no question about that. So I think that the real question that you have to ask yourself is, is am I ready at this point? Not do I simply have these skills? And if you can't answer in the affirmative, are you ready? Uh, can you do this from the communication standpoint? Then, then don't take the job. And you know, I've seen, I've seen far too many, um, you know, officers who couldn't even talk to an inmate, uh, let alone uh, talk to uh, a subordinate or a peer or anything else. And you know, they just think, well, I will develop um, my skills, um, you know, after the fact. And that's simply not the way it works. Yeah. And I would like to add, you know, the, as you move up, obviously it becomes la less for you to be uh, so driven on tasks. You're going to be more about managing people, uh, which is a difficult, very difficult thing to do because you got to keep them motivated, especially through these tough times, like Joe said. Uh, so you got to be able to do your best to 
uh, and we discussed this before, translate uh, buy-in, um, you know, be transparent. Hopefully the people above you are transparent because at the end, in order to keep your people motivated or keep them inspired, uh, you got to be able to translate the why behind whatever is being uh, pushed down. You know, so with that said, if, if there's some strategy that, you know, is going to be complicated, uh, you know, that the staff may be a little resistant with, but you know, that it's something that has to be put out there. You got to find a way to talk to your people and, and keep them motivated. Make sure that you translate that buy-in. I think a lot of times uh, when it comes to communication, people get so concerned and it's, it does matter. I'm not minimizing this, but, you know, they get so focused on certainty and they get so focused on specifics and direction and they wind up uh, not really also adding to balance it out some level of buy-in or uh, some level of connection to the work, which is required during these, uh, during these tough times. I, I think right now, a lot of people know that it's impossible to be certain at these times. So what they're really looking for is clarity. And that comes in when you are transparent and when you know how to translate some connection to the work that's being done. So I would say as a supervisor, if you want your people to want to work, uh, you have to really give them sometimes the reasons to do it or remind them of the reasons why they do it by getting to know them. And I will say one more thing. Um, when you get into that supervisory role, you can't, um, you know, you don't, you don't get to pick and choose people uh, in slices. You get the whole person. So be ready for that. A lot of people may not understand, but one of the toughest things about the supervisory role or when you cross into management is you deal with the whole person, the whole person. And uh, you just got to be able to know how to deal with the whole person. All right. So the next one is, can I make difficult decisions? It's supposed to be under pressure. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but let me just fix that. It'll take two seconds because that's going to bother me. But it's supposed to be, can I make difficult decisions under pressure? So what I have here, I'm just going to read the little blurb, is as a supervisor, you'll face situations that require quick, decisive action, often with limited information and high stakes. So let's reflect on your ability to remain calm and focused under pressure. Are you confident in making decisions that might not be popular but are necessary for the safety and integrity of the facility? And how do you plan to handle the stress that comes with these responsibilities? And the two additional questions are, what process will you use to evaluate the potential consequences of your decisions? And how will you cope with the personal stress and responsibility of making tough choices? All right, Russ, this is you first. So, you know, um, the thing that strikes me about this is, you know, how do you, how do you evaluate what the consequences of your actions are going to be? And um, the only thing that I believe that you really have to go on with uh, respect to that is experience. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of, you know, letting people without uh, at least a requisite amount of time um, and not just in grade, but um, they should have, you know, um, uh, height, depth and width uh, about them with regards to the experience that they have. Um, otherwise, um, how are they going to know what the consequences of their actions um, could could render? And so you have to have uh, a back uh, a backdrop, a background really steeped in that. You have to have you know already uh, bled some, uh, sweated some, and uh, and been under that pressure, and been able to already prove yourself um, to a degree on that. Um, the time for um, the time for finding out that you can't hack it is not in the middle of a battle. So, <clears throat> you know, my recommendation is is make sure that make sure that you um, have been tested and um, that you were not found wanting, uh, and that's uh, you know a real important gauge uh, because there is so much on the line. And um, if you've already proved yourself. If you've already, you know, if your metal's been tested, um, you know, you can go out there with uh, a level of confidence already knowing um, that you don't know everything about what your new job entails, um, but you can be sure that you're going to have uh, a degree of success and you're not simply going to, um, you know, end up uh, 
screwing things up to a degree where someone has to come in and bail you out. True. I like that. And, and what's your thoughts, Joe? You know, the one thing, the one thing most people have to realize is that you're going to have to make some incredible choices in a split second. Um, it could be in the heat of battle. Could be, it could be something as, as simple as a, a inmate on inmate fight, and it can be as drastic as a damn ride or a hostage situation. You know, one of the things you need to understand is, again, it's not about you anymore. Now it's about you leading these people. And when shit hits the fan, these people are looking to you for guidance. So you need to be able to make decisions quickly. Um, you know, I've always said make the decision right or wrong and stick with it. At least you made a decision. You know, being a supervisor, you don't automatically become perfect just by putting the rank on your on your collar. You're going to make mistakes, and that's fine. But, you know, one of the main questions that we've always asked through the boards are, can you make a decision? Can you make a split second decision? And, you know, we've used some scenarios because we want them to get their mindset ahead of time that there's going to be times where you're going to have to, you're going to have to you may be required to make a decision, you know, during the most ungawful scenarios, especially if you're a night shift supervisor. You know, usually sergeants and lieutenants are your highest rank on duty. So, you know, the decisions fall with you. And just be mindset that, you know, you're going to have to make the, you're going to have to make these tough decisions sometimes because you have a shift full of people that are looking to you for guidance during these, you know, during these situations and scenarios. So um, that's something that you need to self-reflect on seriously, because, you know, any kind of hesitation on your part causes hesitation on the team's part. And, you know, that could be harmful, you know, safety wise to a staff member it could be harmful safety wise to an offender. Um, you know, it just, it's just one of the things you need to reflect and, and, and do some, do some self inner thought on to make sure that you are ready and capable and, you know, to hold yourself culpable for making these decisions. Now, now for me, uh, I, I didn't, so I didn't start working with men till about almost eight and a half years into the profession. I I'd started with females and I was there for eight and a half years before I became a supervisor. And that's when I first started with men, uh, working with men. So with that said, uh, I went in very humble. Um, I'm not even going to say I knew what I didn't know because I don't know what I did. I, I had no idea what was going to come my way, but I prepared myself. I, I, I didn't go in uh, to my, my supervisory role, believing that I had to have all the answers. I knew that I was going to wind up asking more questions than I would um, providing answers. I knew that right off the bat. So I went in humble. Uh, I knew that uh, the first thing I wanted to do was have my resources put in play. So I wanted to make sure that I knew who was who on staff that I could, you know, go to and get some advice, like who, who's been at that facility for a while and just kind of see, you know, where I can, you know, get an understanding of, the facility, uh, this new dynamic for me. Um, in moments on the fly, I believe Russ said, you know, you're going to make decisions on the fly. You're also going to make decisions that, uh, you know, may not be needed right now, but, you know, may, may cross into something later on. I've always tried to bring investment. I try to bring everybody's involvement, uh, especially if you're prepared for something that's more long-term. Uh, I look to try to get buy-in before any decisions made, but there are moments where you have to make decisions on the fly and there's just limited information that's around you. So what I try to do is when I can't get all the information that's around me uh, to kind of connect, I do look at my resources and I try to make sure within reason that, you know, I, 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 I make a decision with people's influence that, that makes sense. Uh, but also once that decision is made and we're all in agreement, we're moving forward. I, 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 I we're moving forward because as the supervisor, you know, there are times where, you know, you got to make that decision and, and you just got to stand with it. And then you hope that, you know, it, it plays out well, but if it doesn't play out well, uh, then you can maybe explain why later on knowing that, you know, this was what you were able to do with the information or what the resources you had at that moment. But uh, to kind of close this question off, there's no perfect answer to anything in corrections. Uh, we've talked about this before. You just got to make the decision, the decision, and then just 
roll with it because the cool thing about decision making is this uh it slows things down i mean if you don't make a decision the problems tend to grow 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 a good thing about a decision uh you know when you make one and 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 not and and you know make an effort to make one is the fact that once you make one the world kind of stops for a second uh so you can go ahead and try to figure things out. The biggest concern I have is when you don't make one and the problem just evolves and evolves because we talked about this before. Corrections doesn't deal with difficult problems. We deal with complex problems. The difference is with difficulty, there's a solution. With complex, the shit just keeps growing and you just got to kind of get in the mix uh, as soon as you can. So uh, yeah, and, and again, dealing with a stressful situation, guys, you're not looking for perfect solutions at that point because there's no perfect solution. You're looking for something to motivate you forward. And as for confidence, uh, let me just get on that. Confidence does come, yes, with what you know, but confidence comes with you applying through decision-making. So the funny thing is it's like the, the what is it, the, the chicken and the egg, the chicken and the egg, well, confidence and experience, confidence and experience. You know, you're not going to be good at decision-making until you make decisions. So you got to get in there, make decisions. And I truly believe if you have your team next to you, they're going to help uh, cultivate you into being that decision maker. So yes, you're going to help them grow, but they're also going to hold you up and help you grow as well. So let me get to the next question. All right, hold on. So let's get rid of that one. So the next question, am I capable of handling conflicts among staff and among staff? And inmates, what is going on here? That's what I think. This is when Russ, um, Russ came on. I got a little distracted with his good looks. Let's see. Here we go. Um, so, conflict resolution is a crucial skill for any supervisor. Uh, obviously, consider your ability to mediate disputes and maintain order even when tensions are high. Do you have the patience and emotional intelligence to de-escalate situations between staff or inmates, or staff and inmates? Uh, how will you ensure that conflicts are resolved fairly and consistently in line with the facility's policies and procedures? And then there's two other questions here. Uh, what techniques will I use to de-escalate conflicts before they escalate into bigger issues? And how will I remain impartial and fair in resolving conflicts between individuals I may have personal relationships with? So I'll go with, with Joe first, because we've all dealt with this. Yeah, <clears throat> you know... Dealing, dealing with conflicts, you know, not, not everybody thinks about that when you become a supervisor, um, you know, until the first time you got to get in between, you know, two staff that aren't, you know, getting along or have a difference of opinion that, you know, leads to some sort of conflict. But, uh, you know, dealing with dealing with staff conflicts are hard enough, um, you know, dealing with the inmate, the inmate conflicts it's a little bit easier because we've already been doing that. You know, if, if you're out there and about and, and doing what you're supposed to do, you're going to, you're going to be handling conflicts on a daily basis with the MA population. The ones with staff, a little more touchy, um, you know, due to the fact that number one, they're staff. Uh, number two, you know, they have, they have more avenues they can, they can pursue uh, other than you. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where you got to keep in mind that, you know, I'm going to have to either sit these two down and work this out one way or the other. Um, you know, you can't avoid it. You can't run from it. It's, you got to, you got to be able to handle conflict, you know, especially within staff, because if you don't, it'll fester, um, it'll, it'll snowball into something that it shouldn't because of, you know, you're not taking care of your business and, and handling that at a more informal level. It's easier to head it off while it's still young um, versus trying to get behind it and push it uphill when, you know, it, it, it snowballed. So, you know, you need to, you need to think to yourself that, you know, am I able to handle conflict? You know, if you're the type of person that, that doesn't like to say two words to somebody or uh, you stay to yourself most of the time, um, uh, probably not a good idea to step into supervision because there's going to be times where you have to step in the middle of some pretty damn uncomfortable conversations between two staff members and you're going to have to put a stop to it. You're going to have to find some sort of middle ground. Um, and there's going to be times where you have to escalate it because of what's been said. Uh, it may be an EEO issue, you know, it, it may be a sensitivity issue. You know, there's going to be times where you get put in some pretty damn uncomfortable positions um, but can't run from it. You have to deal with it. I like that. And, and what's your thoughts, Russ? 
Well, you know, when I see that, um, when I say, you know, um, staff are, um, you know, sometimes uh, not doing well with regards to uh, their communication skills, um, they're not doing well with regards to, you know, how they uh, settle conflicts, either between themselves or between themselves and inmates. Um, the way I was uh, looking at this and thinking about it originally uh, was, um, you know, staff um, can sometimes you know, have a view where it becomes kind of an us versus them mentality. And uh, that's not helpful um, in a situation um, or in a context where we're having to deal with and manage um, the inmate population all of the time. Uh, because uh, then what happens is, is then there's an expectation on their part um, that you should always be taking their side. And while you should be doing that and you should be backing them up and you should be doing you know, everything that you can for your staff, the way that you really do something for your staff is by giving them the tools and the mindset and the training um, and the wisdom um, from yourself to them of what they need to be able to do to de-conflict situations between themselves and the inmates or to act upon the conflict that is happening within the basis of policy procedure, state law, federal law, and case law. And um, if we have staff that you know are tending to forget about that is the way that we are supposed to de-conflict and de-escalate or deal with um, situations, um, then they need to be uh, trained better. And I think that you know some staff um, they can be they can be hurt by that, or they can feel that they've been uh, wronged because they do see things as an us versus them mentality. And so um, it's difficult sometimes to maintain your composure when those types of conflicts are going on. But um, I hope I hope that that makes some sense. No, it does. I I'm not, I'm going to be less. Uh, I'm going to be a little tactical on this uh, because I've obviously. I've dealt with a lot of conflicts in my career. I would actually say the conflicts with inmates may be easier than conflicts with staff. Conflicts with inmates, you, for some reason, even though you may maybe have supervisory role with staff, conflicts with inmates, uh, you, you, I think you tend to get more authority. Uh, you know, you're just going to basically get in there and direct them uh, and be done with it, where conflict with staff, sometimes we take it personal, so we don't really go to react. We try to resolve, and I think it's our effort to resolve uh, that puts us in uh, some tough situations, especially if it could cross into an EED matter where a category has been uh, protected category has been violated. Like inmate conflicts, I react. I, I don't got time back. You know, whatever. You're done. You're done, and 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 be done with it. And then see if there's got to be any follow up. Staff, it's different. It's your staff. You care, uh, but sometimes our care could blind us and wind us getting us caught in trouble. I, I get us in trouble. I. I would like to think that we want to make the efforts, as I said, to resolve. Uh, but the problem is you have to also know when it's uh, your issue to resolve and when it's not. I'm just going to say that. And I think that that probably does come with experience. I don't think that's something you're going to know right off the bat, um, even though you do get some training on it. I, I think that you're going to, you know, through experience, you're going to realize, you know, at this point here, I can't always be a peacekeeper. You know, I'm not going to be always going to be able to uh, have an environment where everybody's getting along. They're, you're going to have conflict. So I think the good advice here is, or the advice here is, you 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 may look to resolve when you should just react. So be wary of that. Uh, I think if you react, it, it's technically I should be telling you you should react almost immediately. You know, separate the employees and. And 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 forward it up to whatever that authority would be, just in case there's any violations of uh, protective categories or maybe a hostile working environment that the investigative division needs to know. Because sometimes when you go to resolve and you don't react, uh, someone could say that you never reported the incident or you didn't do what was right, and here you are trying to be the peacekeeper, uh, but one of the parties there expected more from you and you didn't do it, and you know they may have. Uh, pretend to agree with what your solution was but at the end you know there were things that were said that they felt violated these rights or they don't feel safe and now you fail to do your job as a supervisor when you are a supervisor um especially when it comes to an ed matter you're in a position where you have to report it 
it's not you 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 can you have or 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 you should it's it's a must that's the role you play so when you decide that you look to resolve instead of reacting there'll be moments where you could wind up getting written up because the job is telling you that you need to react you know and then after you react here's the funny thing guys after you react and you cover yourself and it turns out that there is no violation so you have no eed concern and you and you have no um and you have no uh you have no uh hostile working environment concern well then now you can maybe either uh depending on how big of a scene it was you can either continue to react and if there's disciplinary because work was uh, not done or whatever it was you could follow through with disciplinary or if it really is just a conflict between personalities you could look to make the resolution uh but i think the advice here is and, and you may not like it is sometimes you need to react first because you never know where that liability uh is going to be as a supervisor but i do try to be the peacekeeper don't get me wrong uh but i think as you gain more experience because this is definitely a, a dialogue that you have to have a greater context to there are moments where you know you, you can't look to resolve you just got to react but again that may come through uh, experience. Uh, all right. So let's go to the next one. So we have here, how well do I understand policies and procedures of the facility? So here we go. So supervisors must have a deep understanding of the rules and guidelines that govern the facility. Uh, basically assess your current knowledge of these policies and your ability to interpret and apply them in various situations. Are you prepared to uphold these standards consistently even when it's difficult? And how will you ensure that your team is also following these protocols? And the two additional questions are, how will I stay updated on changes in policy and procedure? And what steps will I take to educate and reinforce the importance of these protocols to my team? So what do you got there, Russ? Uh, so, uh, you know, this is, this is the situation where, uh, you know, once again, um, the time for the learning curve doesn't happen at the, you know, the beginning of your promotion. Um, this is stuff that, um, you know, you should already be really well steeped in. You should understand, you know, everything from uh, the consequences that have to do with, uh, with maybe the, the unions and so forth to policy and procedure, to state law, to federal law, to case law. Um, and, and everything else. And so you better have um, a really good understanding of it because you could be tested on day one and not have any time to learn it at all. You know, um, you have a, um, an officer that goes out there um, and has to uh, use deadly force on an inmate and kills them. Um, you don't want your learning curve to start there at that point. You should already know that. You should already be steeped in that. You should already have you know, some kind of a handle on that. And I, I would think that um, hopefully your, uh, your facility and your department um, would already have uh, tested you to some degree to know that you know what needs to be done in that type of situation. I know certainly, you know, when I went through the thing, there was, uh, you know, a battery uh, of, you know, the whole uh, verbal interview things where they asked you those questions outright and gave you scenarios that you had to juggle and deal with right there on the spot, um, absent, you know, of course, a lot of the, the stress that would go along with a real one. But they wanted to see if you knew those things and that you could juggle and handle them um, and not have to, you know, learn it on the job. Um, because the, the entry level um, that we have in corrections is, is for the officers. It, it's, it's not for the sergeants. It's not for the lieutenants and above and so forth. I like that. And and then what's your thoughts, Joe? Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with, with yeah, Russ. You, know, you uh you you should be well versed in policies and procedures prior to promoting to, you know, the entry level supervisor. You know, due to the fact that number one, you need to understand you need to understand what the rules and regulations are to keep yourself within the guidelines of policies, procedures and and and, and law. And number two is because now that you're leading a team of, of subordinates, you need to be able to apply these policies and procedures um, the correct way, you know, to keep them out of trouble. You know, you're you're there to you're there to keep keep litigation from happening on either side of the fence liability. 
And that's why it's it's integral that you need to be well versed in, in in the design of the facility, the processes of the facility, the procedures of the facility, and the policies of the agency. Um, you know, this is not something that you need to you need to learn as soon as you become a supervisor. A lot of this you should have already taken the initiative to learn on your own um, to get yourself well versed and get yourself ready uh, for the for the first step in supervision because. If, you know, it, 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 you can't properly supervise if you don't know what you're supervising and how to supervise it. Right. I like that. And, and you know what? I want to add something to this, too. Uh, so as a, as a supervisor, obviously, you're going to be in a position where uh, you're expected to utilize discretion because policy. Uh, I mean, that's great. We know what we have to do, but procedure uh, sometimes you got to adapt and adjust uh, and you're going to be, especially as a frontline supervisor for a lot of the policies that are put out there to those facilities, you are going to be involved with the immediate implementation of it or the application of it. So you, you're going to have to either try to expand or, or work with expanding on the things that work and, and for the things that don't, how do you adjust and then go back to your people and let them know that, Hey, this doesn't work. I tried it out this way. Uh, we need to maybe go this route. And that's why I think it's very good for you guys to have an understanding of policy, which goes beyond just reading it, you know, watching it being applied. Uh, so you could see if, if it is effective or not, but give it time. You're not going there right away to make those changes. But once you start getting experience and, and, and you start to kind of understand more of why things are done that way, then, you know, if, if you feel something could work better and you, you talk to your people and everybody agrees, it's good to forward those suggestions up, but understanding of the policies is needed because that's your foundation for all your decision-making, even when you break out of procedure, because if you don't know what the procedure is, you're not going to be able to defend any of your actions at any level, because even if you're going to court, because the supervisors will always get brought in with the team. You know, if Joe's on my team and Joe messes up, you better believe I'm going to be in that too. And I'll probably be the first one they interview. Uh, and with that said, you understanding policy is great because if it doesn't work, you could explain the flaw and why you had to adapt and adjust, but you have to start where the policy failed. And if it does work, you explain why it worked. So, I mean, the understanding truly matters when you move up uh, and then continue to learn and grow in the process because policies, you know, probably are going to change or the procedure behind the policy will change uh, multiple times depending on, you know, how the facility starts to maneuver uh, as we are moving forward. Practices are totally different now than it was before. So a lot of the procedures still have to, they're still kind of adjusting to the changes we're making overall. It's like funny, the policies are changing, but the procedures are are still treating it as if we're still running these old school facilities or, you know, so uh, I just think right, right now the, the best bet here is to build that understanding so you can be more effective in defending the choices that you're making. Um, okay. So let's go to the next question. Can I set a positive example for others to follow? So leadership by example is one of the most powerful tools in supervisor's arsenal. So you want to reflect on your own behavior and whether it aligns with the values and standards you will expect from your team. Are you committed to continuous self-improvement and professional development? And how will you model the professionalism, ethics, and dedication you want to see in your team? And the two additional questions are, what behaviors do I need to adjust to align with the standards I expect from my team? And how will I demonstrate accountability and integrity in my daily actions? All right. So I'll go with Joe first. Uh, so what do you got, Joe? So when it comes to this, you need to make sure that you're setting an example that number one aligns with, you know, agency directives. Uh, number two, that, you know, also uh, aligns with, you know, integrity. Um you know, you can't expect you can't expect others to be professional and do things correctly um, when you're not setting a good example. You know, don't be one of those do as I say, don't do as I do supervisors. You know, if you want them to be professional, if you want them to have integrity, if you want them to have the commitment, um, you need to be that example. You need to show them that, you know, you are that integrity, you are that commitment and, you know, that you're willing to set that example for them. Um, it's, it's, it's a fact that, you know, 
in order, you know, I, you know, and I always told myself and I've always told my staff, you know, um, I will never ask you or make you do something that I would not do myself. Um, and I said that because I wanted them to understand that, number one, I'm never going to steer them intentionally in the wrong direction. I'm never going to intentionally put them in harm's way. And I expect them to do the same. And, you know, you cannot just say it verbally without practicing it and actually setting the positive example. You know, you can't you can't go in and harp on employees for not coming to work when you're a two day week supervisor because you can't handle the stress and you're never at work. But yet you're griping to your staff about, you know, coming to work and being there and being there when you're scheduled to do so. You need to be a well-rounded, positive example for all your staff to see. If you if you display that enough, your staff are going to fall in line and start showing it as well. But you can't you can't expect them. You can't expect them to do the right thing when you're not the positive example for them to follow. Yeah, and I want to add before we go to Russ, positive example is not subjective. It's not. It's filtered through the expectations of an agency that holds its practices at the highest level of integrity. So with that said, when we're talking about being a positive example it, it, uh, for the job, at least it's a positive professional example because a lot of people may uh tend to believe that a positive example is subjective it's based on what i may see no it's not it's based on the expectations of what the agency expects what the public expects from the people that are working behind that wall who holds that oath to the highest level of uh effectiveness uh through again their efforts in carrying it out sorry about that i wanted to add that That's on you, Russ. Well, oh, okay. I, 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 there was a, uh, there was a, some kind of thing in the transition there. Um, but, you know, I think that um, with this one, um, you know, when I go back and when I, when I think about, you know, the people that had influence on me, um, the ones that I saw as, uh, you know, real true professionals, um, the ones that um, I in some way decided to model myself after, I think that um, that's a really important key, you know, in the person that, uh, in the person and the professional and the, and the sergeant that I eventually became. Um, I think that we have to um, know that I want other people to want to model the things that I do as well, that I want them to, you know, hopefully only the good things. Um, but um, I want them to, you know, um, I want to be able to, you know, give them a little piece of the people that I uh, looked at uh, in, you know, a really eclectic fashion where I basically I, I took pieces of them, the best parts that I could and tried to make them part of my whole repertoire, um, my skill sets and uh, was able to, you know, bring those things that they gave to me to the table. So um, I think that if you've looked if you've looked at your prior supervisors in that way, um, where you thought of them, you know, under those conditions and within those circumstances, I truly believe that then you will be able to pass that on and be able to set that positive example because you're already modeling the things that you saw value in. Um, and I think that, um, I think that's the way that you can know if you can actually do that or not. If you haven't given any thought to that matter, um, if you haven't, uh, you know, uh, actually looked for um, and established and recognized, um, you know, uh, positive role models, uh, positive uh, attributes that you wanted to model, um, then chances are you're not really bringing anything to the table for others to model. Um, because I don't think any of us can claim that we're the self-made supervisor, um, so to speak. Um, we did, um, we did take, you know, bits and pieces from different people and, um, use those to base our skill sets on to actually, you know, bring true value to the table, to be able to, you know, be of service, you know, for the public, to be of service, um, for the department, to be of service for the institution. And so I think that that's um, a real key to know um, whether or not you're capable 
of um, sparking that in others. Yeah, I want to add, like, when it comes to being that positive example, uh, you know, people relate to the person first in uniform uh, before uh, the uniform itself. That means that you wear the uniform. That means you don't try to create the positive example the moment you become a supervisor. You're always trying to create a positive example. I mean, that's the key. And when you become supervisor, it just gives you a, 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 a chance to heighten that positive example, maybe we even a little bit of influence. But if you try to create the positive example, if you try to create the positive example while never being that person to begin with, and then when you cross into the supervisory role, now you want to embrace it, your people are going to see you as hypocrite. Uh, they're going to think it's the position that's domineering and not the person because you were never this person before. And now you're trying to become this person where if you always were, then that's what you're bringing to the position. It's crazy, but it's true. It's, it's the perspective that shifts. If you decide that you want to be on professional, then when you become a supervisor, well, you know, I got to start cleaning up my act. Let me be that positive example. Yeah, go ahead. And, 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 and you got no respect from your people. You know, they're going to think of it as a joke. You're a hypocrite. And then you're going to try to push professional standards. You're just going to think you're trying to push the position because at the end of the day, it's the position that changed you. So all they're going to see you is as a positional leader who's a hypocrite. But if you started with those, you know, that, that good professional role model, that good professional example, and then you cross into the leadership position, there's an expectation that you're going to bring to that high level that is of the, you know, that, that, that good, solid professional example. So now people don't see the position. They see a good, solid person making the position better. So I, I think, to be honest with you, uh, for this, and I know Russ mentioned before communication, I also agree uh, when it comes to being that professional example, this starts long before you even become a supervisor, only because the perspective of once you do, if you were an asshole, you know, before you got the supervisory position and now you want to be that supervisor, you're not going to get the respect of the people that knew you when. They're just, it's, it's just not there. It's going to be every time you want to try to push something, that's the right thing. They're going to, it's going to be positional leadership. It truly is because at that point, the position defines you as opposed to you going in and doing something good with the position. All right, let me get to the uh, next question. So guys, these are, I, I think, I think these are good solid questions and I think we're doing well for people when they decide to step in. Next question is, am I ready to take responsibility for the actions of my team? So as a supervisor, the success and failures of your team ultimately falls on your shoulders. So consider whether you're prepared to accept this level of accountability. How will you respond when things go wrong? Are you ready to provide guidance and support when your team members make mistakes and to stand by your decisions, even when they're questioned by higher ups? And the two additional questions here are, how will I create a culture of accountability within my team? And what is my plan for addressing mistakes constructively and then using them as learning opportunities. What's your thoughts on this, Russ? Uh, Sorry. You know, I think. Ru Hold on. Let me get you, Russ. For some reason, I hit Russ and then Joe. Uh, so so no. let's, get, let's, get it, let's get it back to where we need to be. Here All right. Go, Russ. Here I am. So um, I think that, you know, um, you should always uh, put yourself into a position where you're willing to take ownership of um, – over the, the span of your control, which, you know, includes um, the people uh, underneath you, your, your underlings, um, if you will. Um, I think that, you know, you, you were in there, you were the one um, providing the leadership, you were the one providing the training, you were the one um, that was tasked with, um, you know, honing their skill sets. And so, you know, ultimately there is um, a load of responsibility on your shoulders. You know, and um, one of the things people often seek, you know, is um, a justification to be able to get to get out of it. Or they look for a scapegoat to blame it on other than themselves, um, you know, or they just have not done uh, the work that they needed to do. And so um, those people came up short. Um, and so you just have to be willing to, um, you know, um, to define and take accountability and ownership um, for that which you're responsible for. 
And uh, there's no sense in uh, shrugging it off because ultimately the buck stops with you. Uh, now, it may also stop with other people upstream from you, but that really shouldn't be your concern. Your concern should be with, with what your span of control and your sphere of influence is. Yes, and, and I love that because we mentioned this early in the show, guys, but when you move up, I know some people may think there's a perk of more freedom, uh, and they may even judge that just by I get to go, uh, you know, less people telling me what to do or what it, it, it doesn't work that way. You will be burdened with the responsibility of a greater area of control because even me as prison management, I got the whole facility, sure. But I'm in control. Uh, I have the responsibility of the whole facility too. So you know, when you get that responsibility, it eliminates the freedom uh, almost immediately. Uh, what, go ahead, Joe. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's you know, becoming a becoming a supervisor. It's 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 like I said, it's not about it's not about you anymore. It's about the team, and you got to be willing to take one for the team. Uh, especially if they make a mistake, you know, simple, something stupid, something that's trainable, something that's discussable, you know, you got to be the one to be able to stand up and say, you know, that's on me. You know, I thought they were well versed in this and apparently not. So we're going to have to go back and do some retraining. That's on me. You got to be able to, you got to be able to take the knife sometimes or, or fall on that sword for people. Um, you know, it's not being a supervisor is not being able to chunk whatever employee did wrong underneath the bus tires, uh, you know, unless it's something just totally heinous that, you know, you know, it requires, you know, some some uh, escalated actions. But, you know, on a, on a daily operational level, you know, there's going to be times where your people make some mistakes. And they're not going to go to that person who made the mistake. They're going to come to you because you're their supervisor. You're their leader. You're the example setter. And it may be, look out, Sarge, look out, Lieutenant. You know, I know damn well they know how to pass their people better than that. And, you know, you need to be able to save face not only for yourself, but for your employees and the administration, which means, you know, you're throwing yourself in the meat grinder sometimes. But it is what it is. You do what you do for the good of the people. If it's a simple mistake, you know, get with them afterwards. You get them trained up. You lace them up. You, you know, let them know, hey, look, we need to do a better, you know, job of path search. And don't go down there and go, hey, you know, Warren Gandhi just came and ate my ass out because of the way you're path searching. You know, that's not accepting responsibility. Responsibility is you going down there as a supervisor saying, hey, look, you know, we need to make sure we're doing better path searches. You know, make sure you're starting at the collar and working your way down the arms, down the back, the front, the leg, you know, be able to accept the responsibility enough that you're not blaming it due to the ass chewing that you got from above you and because of the mistakes of the people below you. You know, deal with it, deal with it responsibly, deal with it, uh, you know, professionally and you know be able to you know understand that there's going to be times where you fall on that sword and you know it is what it is it's it's part of being a supervisor you know again you're there to train your people you're there to lead your people and sometimes you're there to protect those people you know and 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 that means that you're having to take one for the team you know because you're getting your ass chewed from from somebody above then you know Take it with a grain of salt, take it with a smile, and then go rectify it. Yeah, and, and guys, remember, you're responsible for the collective team, the team as a whole, which means that your decisions can't be selfish, which includes avoiding conflict. If you got a person that's really pulling down the team and it's like, well, I just don't feel like being, uh, you know, having conflict, I don't feel like you, you got to step up. A lot of times we avoid conflict because we're selfish, because we're more concerned about ourselves when you really got to step up and face the fact that you're responsible for the team as a whole, the team as a whole, which means that you're going to have to deal with a lot of individualized problems. And it's crazy when you think about that, because sometimes it's easier to deal with things as a whole because it's general, uh, you know, you could defer a little bit, but when it comes to dealing with the team as a whole, you got to deal with individualized issues most of the time, which means it's specific and there's accountability to, um, 
you know, you, you are holding people accountable. Uh, so, and the other thing about responsible, I just want to mention that it, you delegate authority. I, I've learned this, but, but you never delegate responsibility because ultimately responsibility is not a task. It's, it's, it's not a task that you delegate. Responsibility is pretty much the outcome of whatever that task would be, you know, to some extent, or the outcome of our f- ability to be effective. I know a, a lot of people think that they kind of sometimes mix up responsibility with simple little jobs, and, and that's not the case. Responsibility has such a greater meaning uh, to the point that I want people to realize you cannot delegate responsibility. At the end of the day, I may be delegating tasks, but I am still responsible for how those tasks are are being accomplished. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, we all should know this, the importance of responsibility. So let's get to number eight. Oh, we lost Russ, but he came back in. Okay, so we lost you for a second for some reason. All right, so let's get number eight. Do I have a clear vision for how I want to lead? So every leader needs a vision. Uh, consider what kind of leader you aspire to be and how you'll implement your leadership style. What are your core values and how will they influence your decisions and interactions with your team? How do you plan to build a cohesive, motivated, and effective team under your supervision? And and there's two support questions. Uh, What core values will guide my leadership philosophy and how will I communicate my vision and goals to my team to ensure alignment and buy-in? So we'll go with Joe first. What do you got, Joe? Well, you know, in order to have the clear vision for to to lead, you got to have the desire to lead. Again, stepping into supervision is not about the the pay scale. It's not about the perks. It's about your desire and your willingness to lead a team. Uh, you know, when you step into that job, you know, not everybody has a a, a pre a pre a pre planned route on how they're going to lead. It's all trial and error until you get comfortable enough in making the daily decisions that, that will correspond with leading your team, you know, but first you have to have, you have to have the desire to lead. If you're in supervision it's because you want to lead, you want to train, you want to teach, you want to protect, you want to, you know, leadership is, is so much more than just a pay scale of perks. If you don't have the desire to lead, it doesn't matter what kind of vision. It doesn't matter how much homework you do on on leadership. If you don't have the desire to lead, you're never going to have the vision to lead. So in order to clearly lead your staff, you need to understand that, you know, A, I'm doing this because I have the desire to lead a team. You know, and and B, I want them to I want them to be just as professional as everybody else. I want them to be safe in what they're doing. You know, you have to you got to have the dedication and the desire to lead in order to have a vision. I like that, Joe. And and what's your thoughts on that, Russ? So, you know, I think that um, you know, when you say do I have a clear vision for how I want to lead? You know, um, what is it um, that we felt that um, did not um, inspire us um, in a way that um, that we thought that, um, see, how can I put this? What is it that I wish my leaders had brought to the table for me? Um, and how can I take that and bring it to the people that I'm going to lead um, and kind of fulfill um, for myself, um, what I always wanted, um, if that if that makes sense, because I think that you know, so many times, um, if we're just in there and we just think that we're going to be functionary and we're going to provide um, the exact same cookie cutter um, that the last guy did, then why are you in there to begin with? Sure, maybe that last guy or gal, maybe he was great, maybe he was fantastic at what he did. But if we're going to stop innovating, if we're going to stop, um, you know, trying to improve, um, what point is there then of actually promoting? I think that um, you should um, have some type of uh, creative ideal um, for what you want to bring to the table, um, some type of uh, new something, some type of new better something. 
um, that can, you know, make an impact. It can make a difference. Um, you know, maybe it's going to be something with regards to the morale of your people. Maybe it's going to be something that impacts safety and security. Uh, maybe it's going to be um, something that, you know, impacts uh, reentry and rehabilitation. But something, um, you know, um, something that you desire has to be what motivates you um, to try and bring change. I mean, we have to um, we have to evolve. You know, we have um, things that are chasing us with regards to, um, you know, new laws, politicians of all things. And um, if we're not um, if we're not trying to innovate, if we're not trying to to improve, then we're just going to be eaten up and we're going to end up with a lot of the conditions that we see today, um, which, in my opinion, is a real shame. Yeah, you know, I, I got, I got to definitely uh, agree with both you guys. I mean, these are tough times, so we want leaders uh, that can motivate, uh, that can shift staff's perspective to something positive within the realm of something realistic as well. Um, you know, the the key right now in in corrections is uh, we are going through concerns, and I don't, you know, I I can't honestly tell you if it's ever going to end. Uh, you know, but we could spend our time looking at the things we cannot control or we could accept, not endorse. We could accept the problems that we're dealing with and find a way to work through it. And it's funny because when you start to accept it uh, as opposed to avoiding it, and again, acceptance is not endorsing. It's not saying yes or I agree, just accepting the fact that this is where I'm at. Then you wind up seeing the world differently and you'll be shocked the solutions that come when you're no longer blaming things on stuff you cannot control, when you start looking at yourself, what are my attitudes to this? What are my efforts? And I think as a leader, you got to talk to the hearts of your people. You know, you got to translate. We mentioned before buy-in, some type of connection, because even though we're going through tough times and yes, we're overwhelmed, we're, we're, you know, we're tired. I get it. But the, the value of the job doesn't change. Uh, it doesn't change. That's why we're we're getting mandatory all the time. I mean, that's why we have to make these sacrifices because even though we're overwhelmed with the the pressures of the job, it's because the pressures of the job are real. They're needed. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't want to go ahead and say that's what we signed up for because it's too totally extreme at this point. I get it, um, but you know, sort of what it is. You know, you you need people behind the wall doing this job. So with that said, I think good leaders now uh, need to make sure that they have a vision, uh, that they believe in that vision, and that they act the vision out. Because at the end of the day, I could have this vision written down and I could have people coming in and seeing all these beautiful things, but my behaviors are in conflict. So I, I, don't, I, I may look at the vision, uh, but I truly don't see it being applied unless I see how people are carrying it out. And if you as a leader want to hold these really good words of value that really, to be honest with you, have no meaning unless you are truly acting them out, then you better be acting them out. Because I could put anything on. I could, here, here, have some integrity, have a little bit of uh, dignity, have a little bit of dedication. And let's, let's just throw those words around with no context. No, it's, it's how about I commit to the actions and then you see the vision through my action. I don't go and I don't have to put it to words. You just see who I am, and then you can figure out the words that best fit what I'm doing in the moment. So having said that, it's great to have a clear vision, uh, but you better know how to carry out that vision because people are watching you. All right, let's get to the next one. So the next one is, am I prepared to continually develop my skills as a leader? So... Leadership is a journey, not a destination. So reflect on your willingness to seek out new learning opportunities, whether through formal training, mentorship, or self-study. Are you open to feedback and willing to adapt as challenges arise? And how will you stay current with best practices and corrections and leadership uh, to ensure that you and your team are always improving? And additional questions is too. Uh, what resources will I seek out for ongoing leadership development? And how will I create feedback loop to receive input on my leadership effectiveness? Russ, what do you got? So, um, you know, I always, um, with this particular one, always think of, you know, honing one's skills, hon honing one's, um, 
character, um, honing one's, um, you know, professional standards at all times. You know, there is no time um, where you should not be sharpening all of those. And so, um, you know, um, when I look at like, um, you know, the thing that I did on uh, my very last day was, was to, you know, go in there and, and find a shank. You know, I never stopped learning. I never stopped trying. I never stopped trying to, um, you know, improve the lot through safety and security of what I was doing. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, just fine and dandy with stagnation. Um, there's a lot of people that, you know, they think, okay, I, I have now promoted, I have now reached the pinnacle. Um, there's no reason for me to exert any more effort in, uh, in drawing myself across that whetstone and making myself into the uh, instrument that I can be, you know. And I think that we do ourselves a real disservice um, in that regard. We should be constantly striving to better ourselves, constantly making sure that we're as sharp as we can be. So um, that's just the way I've always put it. That's the way I've always uh, tried to explain it to people. And just know that we can never stop striving because it's not any fun. Uh, you know, I enjoy um not every day not every time not every situation but i loved my job you know um i loved the effort that i put into it and um you know i loved the idea that um i could be you know a, a little bit better each day it might only be incremental but um with that kind of consistency um i felt like uh, anyone could go from being uh you know a good serviceable officer to being a great officer um mm -hmm. to being a great sergeant um and you just have to put in that little bit of consistency and so i believe that that's the key to um, really truly actually being able to enjoy what you do because if you're really really good at it then um there's no chance that you're just gonna you know sit there and stew in a vat of correctional toxicity and just, you know, hate the job and hate everything that's associated with it. I agree with that. That's actually very powerful, Russ. Um, hey, Joe, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, as a leader, you always want to you always want to hone your skills. You always want to develop yourself to be better because, you know, if you develop yourself to be better, you're going to develop your people to be better. Um, you know, if you don't look for something new to learn as a supervisor, uh, as a leader, you absolutely become stagnant. Um, and when you become stagnant, your people become stagnant because there's nothing, there's nothing new for, for you to pass on to them. You know, you're not just learning and honing skills for yourself. You're looking for things new that you can learn that you can pass on to your people to make them better correctional officers, to, uh, to make them better prepared for taking a step into leadership. Um, you know, I, there was, I, I mean, it, 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 you know, it was almost like a preacher. It was almost like, a pre, you know, being a preacher. You know, you, you always want to deliver the good word to your, to your, you know, to your people, to your flock. And, you know, if you're not continuous, continuously looking for something new to learn uh, or ways to keep yourself sharp, um, you can't keep your people on your toes if you're not always on your toes. So, you know, don't become the stagnant supervisor that is just complacent and happy to be there drawing a check, uh, doing the usual grind day in and day out. Um, you know, look for something that's going to challenge you. And then, you know, in turn, take that ability, take that knowledge and go challenge your people. Right. And I want I want to mention something, too. So obviously, in agreement with both you guys, I'm going to go a little further out, though. So as I get closer to the end of my career. i got a couple of years left. Uh, I'm, I'm looking more to give back than to receive. I, I think I've kind of made the decision to kind of stop moving up. Um, if that's my choice, uh, we'll see. Uh, and then just basically try to start leaving things, you know, you know, creating that legacy, if you will. So I read all these books I have. I have all these books, leadership, correctional stuff. I mean, I've written a few. And the reason why I'm doing a lot of writing now is because I'm still in the profession. So I know for a fact that I'm still... Um, you know, learning every day. I'm still motivated because I think for me, the writing comes from having a tough day and then 
venting something. That's why when I write these books, they're uh, kind of like a uh, journal format. You know, they're written in a way that, you know, has a quick thought and then we move on. It's usually, I think it really is just a more of a journal, but it's a healthy uh, vent. Uh, so with that said, my biggest concern right now is that I, if I continue to learn, I have to be able to apply it. That's the key. So what I'm asking myself right now is if all the stuff that I've learned, uh, and I got to figure this out, I, I, this is a, a big thing for me right now, uh, is if all the things that I'm learning, where is it going to, is it going to be a plot? Is it going to be applicable uh, in a couple of years? Once I retire, am I, am I going to con continue doing this? Am I going to continue doing, um, you know, the speaking engagements? Cause I, I'm going to plan to do those again. I, I just took a little hiatus this year. Am I going to continue to write books? I mean, do I, do I find myself act actively pursuing what's happening in corrections or once I leave, will I just really shift my focus to things that are a bit different, which is tough. It's tough because I have really made my learning in this profession intentional. So it's not going to be that easy just to let go of things. Um, but I don't know if that's going to be my choice. If I no longer enjoy it, because that's why I do these things. I don't think this is work. So I'm hoping that doesn't shift when I retire. I enjoy this. Um, but with that said, I mean, I, I give kudos to Russ, to Joe, to people that have retired, Gary Cornelius, who still come back and uh, keep on creating new things because to continue to be motivated long after you're outside the profession or to go back into the profession uh, truly has a connection that I really, uh, I'm not going to know if I truly have until I am gone out of the profession. That sounds crazy, but it's true. I, I'm very connected now because I have the chance to apply things in my effort to continue to learn through experience. That's why I love this profession because I could always try something new. But when that's no longer available, uh, will I continue to love that aspect of learning? So now with that said, I'm not going to say I stopped learning because I learned something every day. I'm in prison management. I learned something new every day. Uh, but with that said, with my amount of time left, and this is just for me. Uh, I, I'm not giving this as advice. This is just I'm venting right now. So maybe this will relate to people who may feel the same way. I don't know. Um, but I'm in a position right now in prison management where I could just learn things passively because, uh, you know, you're facing dis different situations every day. So I, I, I'm no longer chasing things intentionally unless I'm trying to do something for the channel and I'm sitting with Russ, or I'm sitting with Joe. But technically, that's still passively. Because I just may ask Russ a question and Russ is just going to toss me some knowledge in and I'm just going to go with what Russ says because Russ has got that experience. You know, Joe's got that experience. So I think as I got closer to retirement or I'm getting closer to retirement, uh, my intentionality has slowed down a little bit. This is not a good thing. I'm just, I'm being honest, but there's a balance because I work in a very active facility. So I'm not bored. So I'm still being, uh, I'm still learning things passively. Now, funny, if I went to a slower jail, would I try to balance it out with being more intentional? I don't know. I don't know. So I got to figure out where I'm going to be in the next couple of years. Uh, but as of right now, uh, if I could just get, move from the vet and just say, guys, you got to learn every day. If you're going to be a supervisor and you're going to take control of people uh, that you now have to supervise, you have to move yourself up because if you don't, then I think we said it. They remain stagnant. You like like John Maxwell says. You will be the you will be the lid on their growth and development. And the good people, the ones that you really want to motivate to become leaders, they're going to grow right past you and leave you. It's that simple. So I, I don't know what happened there. I went on a little bit of an event there. All right, last question. Um, last question. Okay, so can I balance the needs of the institution with the well being of my staff? Uh, this is a good one. So supervisors must walk a fine line between meeting the operational demands of the facility and ensuring the well-being of their staff. Consider how, we, how you will balance these often competing priorities. What strategies will you use to keep your team motivated and supported while ensuring that the facility goals are met? How will you advocate for your team's needs while also holding them accountable to institutional standards? Uh, two additional questions here is how will I ensure my team feels valued and supported while maintaining high performance standards and what approaches will take what approaches will I take to advocate for my team's needs to upper management? I will go with Joe first. 
Well, you got to be that. You got to be that buffer between the upper management and your and your staff. You got to be not only the communicator. You got to be the negotiator. You got to. You know, there's a ton of things that you do as a supervisor um, to to you know buffer between yourself. You know, between those above you and those below you. Um, you know, you got to be able to communicate the needs of the facility as per the administration. You got to be able to, you know, uh, almost like being a car smell, uh, car salesman, you got to sell it. You got to be able to sell it tactfully. Um, you got to make them buy into it. Um, and you got to make them understand that they're appreciated for what they do. Um, you know, again, you can't just go in and hammer on them all the time because eventually you're going to beat them down emotionally um, into a disconnect status. <clears throat> so you got to be able to, uh, you know, be able to perform all the functions of your daily operations um, with the mindset that, you know, your staff is, they're, they're your biggest asset, you know, without them, there is no you, without them, there's no team. So you need to be able to communicate that to them. And, you know, the, the more you communicate how important their job function is to the needs of the facility, not so much to you as an individual or a supervisor, um, but to the needs of the facility and to the needs of the agency, uh, the more they're going to buy in and, and the more they're willing to, you know, um, put themselves up on a higher emotional level um, that, you know, portrays, you know, a positive image for them, portrays a positive image for you, um, for the facility. Um, so that's something that you need to, to understand and balance. There's going to, there's going to be times where the administration brings stuff to you. It may not always be positive news. It may be, it may be some sort of negative feedback. Um, the way you communicate to that, the way you communicate that to your staff plays a big portion. Um, I know in my career, there's been a multitude of times there's been, you know, a lot of ass shoes I took that I never communicated back to the staff because I did not want to portray that negative image to them, especially for, for those who have been trying so hard, um, who have been, been loyal to the, to the needs of the facility and, you know, who always comes, you know, they always come to work, never call in, you know, that, that kind of, that, that kind of, uh, reputation with your staff. So, you know, be mindful, you know, the way you balance the needs of the facility versus the well-being of your staff, because, you know, in, in the in the grand scheme of things and in the long run, without your staff, um, you know, there are no needs of the institution because there's nobody there to meet those needs. Mm. And what's your thoughts, Russ? Oh, you're muted, Russ. Let me unmute you. You're muted. Oh, there you go. I said, oh. I said, oh, man, Joe, Joe hit it right there at the end because I, I was going to start right off with uh, saying, you know, um, really do the, you know, isn't the uh, well-being of staff an actual uh, need of the institution? Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, how, how, do we, how do we balance that? Shouldn't we always be, you know, looking out for the best interest of staff? So, um, I, so I don't think I can, I can, you know, pile on any, anything better than, than Joe has there, but I think, you know, I would just, I would just say that, you know, I think that we, I think that we have to look at, um, I think we have to, you know, look at this from the perspective of, of, um, you know, we are our brothers and sisters keepers and, um, and, you know, I, I really hate the fact that sometimes we end up with so much um, division between the layers there, you know, and, you know, sometimes we have, uh, you know, admin or management, um, and, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that the, that the lower levels like the, like the supervisors and the, and the um, line staff um, aren't guilty of this as well, but um, it's easy to stratify and uh, stay apart from each other and assume that your little part of the fiefdom matters more than all the others. And that's, that's from the bottom to the top and the, and the top to the bottom. Um, so instead, I think that, you know, the, the proper way to look at it um, is to try and not stratis stratify people and to, you know, not uh, be involved in things that are divisive um, but really um, try and look at it that, um, that you know, um, 
doing the best we can for people overall and investing in their well-being is an investment in that uh, in that institution and in that department. And uh, and I think that, you know, th that's the that's the proper way to try and look at it. And I just think that, you know, too many times, um, you know, we get um, lumped into our own little um, spheres of influence. And uh, then it's easy to become haters of the other ones above us, to the side of us, below us, whatever. Yeah. And, and, and guys, in my in my learnings, my reading, but uh, more so in just every day, uh, when you when you become a, a, a supervisor, you start to take the you know the higher positions where you have authority. Uh, you're not in it to be popular. Uh, so <laughs> let's just let's just go ahead and uh, put that out there. You're not in it to be popular. Uh, the second thing is, guys, you're going to spend most of your time balancing uh, what John Maxwell would say would be candor and um, tr uh, candor and care. You know, you, you basically have to be truthful with your people, but you have to also show them that you care. And this is an effort to be productive because at the end of the day is you also have to fulfill a promise to the people that put you in that position. So there's a loyalty to the people that you lead 100%. Uh, but there's also got to be a, a loyalty to the people that put you in that position to know that you are going to be productive in, in what it is that they expect. So you got to meet expectations uh, from both sides. You know, you got to meet the care that your frontline expects from you because you are their leader and you are meant to translate uh, their concerns, uh, their needs, not, their, not, not always their wants, but their needs at a higher level. And then management on down is going to translate strategy. They're going to tra translate things that they need you to try to connect to your people, you know, to try to get that buy-in so they want to do the job. So even if they give it to you very plainly, your job is to get that buy-in. Uh, one of the things I learned here is um, when it talks about balance the needs of the institution with the well-being of my staff, you have to make sure... Uh, and a lot of people, there, there is a balance. This is tough. This is tough because, so I, 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 I kind of do the employee morale uh, where I work and it's tough because the problem is we're at such an us versus them where this crazy generalized animosity going so many different ways that sometimes people will believe that the expectation of the agency is against the well-being of the staff. And in no way am I trying to translate that message. So let me go ahead first and uh, not even when I, I don't want to discuss that part, because even if you tend to believe it to be true or not at your specific agency or your specific facility, that's not how we're supposed to operate. So with that said, uh, how we are supposed to operate is the the expectations of the agency are should be 100% perfectly aligned with the well-being of your staff because the well-being of your staff have to carry out those expectations and if they're not in line we have to figure it out together you know we have to figure out what's going on so we can keep moving things together uh, in the right direction i want to add that when you're a leader of a, a, of a specific team, let's say Russ was a sergeant and Russ has his team of individuals uh, that he leads. His job is to advocate for his team 100%, but to a certain level. Uh, when he starts to uh, also embrace the supervisory role, he has to realize that there are expectations. So Russ, when he advocates for his team, he's not advocating in a rebellious manner. He's speaking his needs. He's defending for his people, but in no way he's being disrespectful with it. And Russ also kn knows that, it, it, that, believe it or not, the team you lead is secondary to the team you're a part of. And a lot of people don't want to understand that because they get so close to their team uh, that they lead that they maybe they wind up maybe advocating for selfish things that don't blend with the needs of the house at the highest of levels, which means what brings us together? You know, what brings us working as one? Are we meeting the needs at the highest of levels? 
So with that said, sometimes we may sit at a meeting and we're trying to move things that's beneficial for all departments. And we may just keep on getting resistance from one department, one department, and that department may, you know, disguise that or disguise that resistance as they, you know, the department head may say, well, I'm doing what's best for my people. We get it. And we respect that. But unfortunately, you're not helping us meet the needs of the entire house, because as you move up, especially when you get into prison management or the agency at the highest of levels, we're responsible for all the people. So the decisions that we have to make have to be very balanced and correct. And if there's ever a chance where one decision has to shift towards another apartment, uh, one is we have to get people to understand that. But one, we want initial buy-in. We don't want people to feel that, you know, uh, custody got this today, which means rehabilitation lost. That's not how this world is supposed to work. It means if custody got this, then rehabilitation has got to find a way to work around that and, and work in support of what custody needs and, and, and vice versa, not, you know, uh, rehabilitation gets this and now we're just uh, to defeat because we're not going to be involved. You know, conflict is great if it's healthy conflict because we have trust. But I think the part here where it comes to that expectation, I think the expectation, the biggest expectation we have to have as a supervisor is that we answer to a higher need of the house. And there will be times, uh, and they're very tough times, but there will be times where you have to understand and accept. I didn't say agree, but you have to accept that the team you're a part of may be greater than the team you lead. And that could be, listen, there are times when I lead a house and I want to do what's best for the house but it's just not what's best uh, for the overall agency at that time. So again, I, I think that's something you want to definitely recognize that starts to bring a balance to uh, the higher level uh, needs of the house. Um, does anybody have anything they like to say in close? And I'll go with uh, Joe first and Russ. I, mean, I hope what I said made sense. I'm not trying to be controversial. No, I mean, it absolutely makes sense. You know, it, it, for those who are watching the video and are thinking about, thinking about the next step, you know, becoming, you know, from frontline to leadership, you know, make sure that you're doing it for the right reason. Make sure it's because it's in your heart that you want to lead. It's not because you want the prestigious, uh, prestigious title of Sergeant, Lieutenant, Captain, Major, Warden, uh, Director, Commissioner, you know, however it's ranked, the ranking structure is in your facility. If you don't have it in your heart to make this, make this lead uh, to make this, you know, transition from, from frontline to leadership uh, for the right reason, you know, step aside and, 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 and wait and let somebody else take that turn that, that actually wants to lead, you know, right now we're at such a, a unprecedented time in, in the correctional industry <clears throat> that, you know, I, I, I'm sure everybody feels that, you know, most facilities nowadays feels like a runaway car wreck. Um, we need leaders that are, that are willing to jump in there and get the vehicle back on track, get it back in the race and, and, you know, get it back on the board. You know, being a leader is, is not always prestigious. It's not always fun. Um, but it is purposeful, uh, purposeful, purposeful if your heart's in the right place and you have the ability and the desire to lead people. That's what we need. We need leaders. We don't need followers. We need leaders. We need people that are going to, you know, take all the new officers and train them, give them the proper guidance that they need. And, you know, if you have the experience, you know, if, if, if you're a supervisor that's that that state of correctional officer for five, six years, sometimes, you know, some of them 10 years before they decide to promote, use that experience for the positive. Pass that knowledge, pass that experience to your staff. Make them better individuals, make them better correctional officers, make them better leaders. You know, do it for the right reason. Don't don't do it just for the title, because, you know, if you're doing it just for the title, you're you're not going to wind up in a good place. And neither is your your staff. I like that, Joe. And, and what's your thoughts, Russ, in closing for this? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, it all comes down to. Um, you know, dedication. 
Um, if you're the type of person, you know, who, you know, really wants to put yourself out there and to try and, you know, better things for your staff, better things for the institution, better things for the public with regards to, you know, better safety and, and better security, then you are exactly uh, what um, I think any correctional facility uh, would want to find and, and want to have. But if you don't have dedication, if you just have, you know, um, external uh, motivators um, with regards to the reason that you're doing it, then um, then you're probably not a good fit. Um, the sad part about it is, though, is that um, there are lots of uh, supervisors out there who are, you know, just, you know, externally motivated. They they want the position, they want the glory, they want the money, and um, they're just not invested in uh, the nuance of the internal uh, motivators um, that the best supervisors have, um, which is, you know, wanting to um, elevate the people around them. Um, you're not being elevated above them when you receive a promotion. Uh, you're simply given a chance to elevate them uh, by providing the leadership um, and the training and the knowledge and the other things that people have identified in you um, to be able to try and, uh, like I said, to elevate them up. Yeah, guys, I, I think my closing, obviously, it's hard to top what these gentlemen have said. So just an effort to compliment. I think anything related to um, corrections has to have balance. I think that's always key. I think uh, even when it comes to becoming that supervisor, how do you balance expectations at what I mean by expectations are, are, tra are, are translating the needs that both go up and go down. So your job somewhere in the middle is finding balance. And it's funny because sometimes we get so lost in trying to balance wants uh, that we confuse them with needs. And we wind up in, in the middle of it all as supervisors really getting confused as why am I having so much trouble trying to balance this expectation from the agency to this uh frontline tactical side and then you, you got to kind of step back and say well, what am i trying to do here is it a, a want or a need i mean is this a need or am i just wanting to be popular and and and, and trying to uh go ahead and, and and try to translate a want uh that i just can't seem to get um i get through and, and it does become very overwhelming for people in middle management or people in supervisory roles because you only have so much energy and in this world people really only admire outcome over effort so you wind up being the first to get disenfranchised because the people below you want outcomes and the people above you want outcomes and you can only control your effort. Uh, so with that said, it's, it's about finding balance. I think that's the best advice we can give you here. Can you be balanced? And I guess the center of that balance is going to be where the needs of management meets the needs of frontline. I think that I think that's the best way to say. It. And then you have to find a way to navigate that. And that's all I got. As always, guys, the show is tear talk. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's good. Notify your temples with video. Stay safe.